Um, second day, go to Berlin. Happy to be here. Uh, my name is uh, Johan Stocking. I'm uh, tech lead and co-founder of the Things Network. And in this talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do uh, and also the activities uh, in Berlin. Um, and I'm also going to walk you through a bit of the journey that we uh, had the last uh, three years when we started. Uh, and that really starts with uh, technology. Uh, so the talk is a little bit technical, uh, not necessarily on just software, but also a little bit of physics. Um, but first, um, I like to tell always uh, the difference between the Internet of Humans and the Internet of Things. And that's often um, mixed when you look at technology. A lot of IoT uh, devices, they actually use a wireless connectivity that is designed for human interaction, like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or cellular. And those technologies are designed for streaming or web browsing, uh, low latency, uh, high bandwidth, uh, short range, but also uh, they cost a lot of power. And that doesn't really fly for devices that are installed somewhere remote, uh, like street lights or um, garbage bins that you cannot charge all the time. So um, if you look a little bit about the numbers, and this is just the, the really boring predictions, um, but you see that there is a huge growth expected, and we also see this happening in, in the world of IoT, uh, getting billions of devices connected. And this is not just scaling up the existing devices. This is not only the smart TVs that you get in your home, but these are also, this growth also needs to be driven by, because this exceeds the number of people in the world, this also uh, is driven by a new class of uh, IoT devices. And we focus with our initiative more on a new class of devices that doesn't really exist today, that need a technology um, uh, that is not Wi-Fi or cellular or 3G. And the thing with, with IoT is always uh, the economies of scale. And if you look at the total cost of ownership in IoT, you have design, development, material, certification, everything, commissioning, uh, connectivity, maintenance, support, everything together, uh, while you ideally want to have devices that are maybe 8 euro or 10 euro uh, in volume. And everything needs to be in that price. And connectivity, that is what we focus on um, it, with our initiative. But the rest is, is also equally important. And what you see is that if you uh, decrease that price, you have maybe uh, on top, that's what we are now somewhere, um, where uh, the scale is not that big. But once you see that prices drop, that the scale increases and that IoT is, um, uh, gets a lot of traction also in uh, markets where uh, it's not feasible today. For us, it all started with LoRa. And LoRa is a long-range uh, modulation uh, that is designed for IoT, uh, and that allows to um, transmit data over kilometers of range. And I have a little bit of details about that later. What's really interesting is that you can connect uh, thousands, thousands of devices to a single gateway. And actually, there's not really a connection between a gateway, but it's more like that a sensor sends a message and that a gateways around receive that message. So there's no pairing like with Wi-Fi. There is no cells like with uh, cellular. And that makes it super scalable. Also, it's super low power, very small messages. Um, so devices can run on solar panels or, or autonomously uh, or, or for years or months on, on batteries. And if you look at communication, uh, wireless communication, uh, what we are used to, uh, and, and this is always the analogy with uh, talking with somebody, if you're close to somebody, like in, in the same room, if you have a conversation, you can, you can talk fast and quiet. You don't need a lot of energy to communicate. But if you're further away, uh, you need to scream and you need to talk slower. And the same works with wireless communication. And this is about frequencies. And this is where uh, LoRa comes in. And what, means, what, what does loud communication mean? So you have there on the left, uh, you see two ways of transmitting data uh, over a long range. So we, we're talking about kilometers here. Uh, one, one of the things you can do is uh, use a narrowband waveform. And that's putting a lot of energy on a single frequency. And the more energy you put on the frequency, the further your signal gets. 
You can typically only do this when you have a license to the spectrum. And uh, telecom operators, that's what they have. They, they acquire a license uh, through auctions. Another way to um, get data far through the air is to use a so-called spread uh, waveform, a spread spectrum. So you choose a, a center frequency and you modulate your data around that center frequency. And that is what LoRa uses, because LoRa uh, operates in the ISM bands, the industrial, scientific and medical bands uh, that are open for everyone to use. So they are unlicensed, but they are still regulated. So you cannot uh, transmit with a lot of energy. Uh, but you can uh, trans you can do whatever uh, by uh, with uh, limited energy, and here on the right you see what the modulation looks like uh, in a spectrum analyzer. Uh, so you see the it's a center frequency, and the symbols are kind of modulated around that frequency. LoRaWAN is a uh, protocol, a messaging protocol on top of LoRa. So LoRa is the physical layer; it's, it's getting data through the air, and LoRaWAN is the um, uh, basically the, the, the messaging protocol on top of that. And this is a typical LoRaWAN message. Uh, so this is hexadecimal. Uh, that is what, what essentially is modulated in those sim symbols. And uh, I colored here the different parts of the message, your message type. This is a device address, which is very much like the source IP address. Um, there is a, uh, a header of the message. There is a frame counter. Uh, the, the port, uh, much like TCP ports, this is the actual payload, in this case only three bytes, and this is a message integ integrity check uh, for, uh, that's used for encryption and uh, integrity, um, identifying the device. This payload is, of course, also encrypted with, uh, with an um, encryption key. So um, uh, that's just a little bit of details, uh, introduction to, to LoRa, and uh, one more slide about physics, two more slides about uh, physics, because it's, it's so important when you look at IoT. Uh, this is where um, uh, I try to explain how, uh, what physically you have to deal with when you transmit data through the air. So there on the top left, you see a transmit, and on the uh, y-axis, the transmission power in, in uh, dBm. And you can transmit in, in, uh, in LoRa, for example, with 14 dBm. That's very little, so 25 milliwatts. And then you have a connector loss. There's an antenna gain. And then eventually, this is where the data goes through the air. On the receiver side, um, what is really powerful in LoRa is that uh, LoRa receivers are super sensitive. And that means that you can have a lot of loss th during transmission. Uh, because of the distance, or because of interference, or because of uh, uh, attenuation, or other things, um, but still be able to receive uh, a signal. And that is called the receiver sensitivity. And if you compare and basically subtract the transmission power with the receiver sensitivity, you get the so-called link budget. Okay, so link budget is a number, it's in dBm, and that uh, gives you is an indicator of how far data can go through the air. And if you compare that with Wi-Fi, uh, Wi-Fi has a theoretical link budget of 95 dBm, uh, unlicensed LP1, so that's LoRa, uh, 151 dBm, and licensed LP1, so that's narrowband IoT LTEM, uh, around 152, which is similar. It's similar, but what is powerful about LoRa is that you need the, the TX power is less. And that means that you need less power to send a message. Uh, and that is good for your battery. There's a formula here to calculate the theoretical maximum. So far, the physics. Um, our community, the Things Network, and I will explain a little bit later what, what we actually do, they thought, OK, um, if the theoretical maximum is 850 kilometers, that's what you can calculate with that formula, let's test that. Let's see how good this technology really is. So uh, Thomas, uh, it's one of our uh, community contributors. He created uh, a weather balloon with helium, and he attached a very small sensor to it. And he uh, let it go uh, just uh, in, in center of the Netherlands. And it flew to the German border. And at 26 kilometers of altitude, it sent a message. 
and it was picked up by a gateway uh, that is connected to our network uh, more than 700 kilometers away. And this is, of course, not a real-world scenario because we very often then get the question, so uh, can you cover Europe with only a single gateway? And that's unfortunately not working. So why does that not work? Uh, there's attenuation, so there are, uh, there's always obstructions. In cities, you have reflection and diffraction. That's also why your GPS uh, is not uh, often very performant in cities. And finally, there's a Fresnel zone, and that means that even if you have a line of sight, um, you can still get obstructions from things uh, around that. So LoRa is not really about uh, competing with other technologies. We still think in, in the billions of devices that um, there is a lot of room for uh, NFC, for near field communication, like passive contactless payments, uh, uh, tax scanning, Bluetooth is perfect for personal area networks, wearables, uh, headphones, Wi-Fi, smart home, smart office, uh, short range, uh, high throughput, uh, smaller deployments, uh, typically. Narrowband IoT is, is more in the field of LoRa, uh, but narrow, narrowband IoT is licensed, so you are always depending on your telecom operator uh, for providing coverage. Um, so it's a little bit more expensive also, but it will work very well for connecting cars, for example. And LoRa, is, is very useful when you need to con have control over your infrastructure. So uh, on, on a farmhouse, you put a gateway and you can cover the entire farm. Uh, or you can um, provide coverage underground where your telecom operator uh, does not have uh, coverage. Uh, smart buildings also indoor coverage uh, by setting up gateways inside uh, really big offices and things like that. Um, this is kind of the overall topology of such a network. You have on the right, you have on the left, you have devices, uh, gateways. Those receive traffic. Uh, gateways can receive of multiple gateways can receive the same message. Then there's a network server, uh, and there's the user application. So the application usually just deals over the internet with with a network server, and this is pretty much like software defined networking, uh, where uh, this is where the the wireless communication happens. So back to July 2015, when we saw this technology, we thought, okay, we, we need to do something with this. And we heard that um, a few national operators in Europe announced to deploy a nationwide uh, LoRaWAN network. So KPN in the Netherlands, Proximus, Belgium, Orange in France. And we thought uh, we can do this as well because they also use the ISM bands and they are as much open to them uh, as they are to us. But instead of coming up with a uh, commercial network, we decided to build a community network. And so we formulated our mission to build a decentralized, open, and crowdsourced Internet of Things data network. And that's owned and operated by its users. So it is very different. So in, we, we took the technology, we implemented the network server, and we invited everyone to buy a base station, set it up their, their building or in a window and to create one big collaborative network together. So uh, my uh, co-founder pitched this idea at an IoT meetup in Amsterdam. And the next day, we gathered with the few first uh, co community contributors that were interested in, in joining this initiative. So um, I was here working remote. I was actually... Um, in Berlin here, uh, dialing in, and there was a guy from uh, a physics uh, professor, there was a police officer, there was a student in electrical engineering, just random people, uh, thinking, okay, how can we, how can we uh, build this? And the initial plan was to cover the city of Amsterdam by just calling companies that we used to work for, uh, companies that we knew had a good location, like a high-rising building, and we asked them, hey, do you want to buy a gateway? It costs about 1,200 euro. Uh, you have to pay it yourself, but we come by to install it. And, and they all said yes, yes. And that uh, was kind of the kickoff of the Things Network with a citywide network with um, maybe 10 gateways covering Amsterdam. And we needed a use case. And uh, because you with IoT and, and network coverage, there's always the chicken and egg problem. 
Uh, like, do you uh, set up a network first, or do you have a use case and then set a network up for that use case? And that second approach is often being used, and it makes a lot of sense. But it means that the network is often very expensive because it's for that single use case. So we decided to have a network-first approach by deploying a network and then leave it up to the community to come up with creative ideas and to get started with Arduinos. And we do a lot of workshops to make use of that network. To show the network in Amsterdam, uh, and this is a typical local Amsterdam use case, we decided to uh, create a very small sensor to put in a boat. And I don't know if you've been to Amsterdam, but in Amsterdam you have the canals and, and little boats where you can, you, you can basically put your own boat in, in, in the canal there. Um, but a lot of these boats are, are very shitty and they're almost sinking. And uh, this is a very common uh, thing that there's water in the boat. And so the sensor would essentially, you just put it in the boat and it sends you a message uh, when, uh, when there's water detected. And this is very simple, but it's, it's super useful and a new and a good example of a new class of IoT devices, even though this is a very simple uh, example, because you cannot use Wi-Fi here, because you don't know the password of all the Wi-Fi hotspots around your boat, because it's not in front of your house. You cannot use Bluetooth here, because if you, the range is too short. Uh, if you are near, close with your phone for the Bluetooth signal to pick it up, you might as well look in the boat yourself. Um, cellular may work, uh, but you need a data plan. Uh, so you pay per month, uh, and you need to charge the battery all the time. Uh, so LoRa is actually perfect here. If you have a citywide network, you just put a sensor in the boat. It's free on the community network. Uh, and you get a message that your boat is underwater. This is in Dutch, but I think you Germans can kind of understand this. This was actually the night before our launching conference in 2015. And uh, I was working uh, at home and uh, trying to fix this. And um, I was obviously very happy seeing this message that you pour water on a sensor and that you wait a few seconds. And then you know that the sensor communicates over a few kilometers of range. Everything is processed. And then some Twilio API, it's very simple. But at the time, we felt like rocket scientists. Uh, and. Uh, and it, it didn't just stay in Amsterdam. We created this as a recipe for everyone to replicate. And so communities started to pop up all around the world, all Things Network communities. We gave them branding assets. We gave them uh, community pages, uh, everything to create their own community. But it's all decentralized. So we don't own anything. We don't control anything. We have local initiators in the city uh, that set up a network themselves. And when I arrived here, in Berlin the day before yesterday. In the evening, I had dinner with uh, Gerhard, and he is the uh, initiator for the Berlin community. And I never met him in person, but he manages the whole community here with 62 gateways connected to the public network. And, uh, and that's just without any effort from us. And it's also not doable for us, because we don't speak Japanese or, uh, or Spanish or Portuguese or anything like that. We celebrated our... Um, uh, third anniversary in August. Uh, we are now the biggest uh, global LoRaWAN network. Um, and, um, and then we often get a lot of questions. So uh, what do people use your network for? Uh, and uh, th that's a very good question. And very oftentimes I say, I don't know. Because if you, if you remember the, 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 the array of bytes that I showed you here, that payload is encrypted. Uh, we don't know what kind of devices are connected to our network. But we, sometimes we hear on conferences or people come to us and they say, oh, we connected this to your network. Uh, and so it's, uh, I have a few examples uh, for my presentations. And one is um, actually a really, really cool story. Um, it's a guy that um, uh, owns um, a vineyard in California. And he spends a lot of money on uh, irrigation, uh, watering his vineyard. And so he decided to uh, make a sensor to see where the uh, where it was necessary, where the uh, where the soil was uh, very dry. So he created uh, a sensor. It's kind of a, a stick with soil moisture sensors on different levels. He put it in the ground. There's a small antenna uh, on top, and it sends the soil moisture levels 
uh, in different places. It's very simple. They have a he has a gateway on his farmhouse, and he receives this data. And then with with some home soldering Arduino, uh, he uh, triggers his irrigation system with this data. And he published this online, and he uh, it's open source, and um, he got a lot of requests from vineyards in Italy and Spain and South Africa to use that system, uh, but they were not able to solder it themselves, so he was soldering it for them. So he had 500 units to solder, and in the middle of soldering that, he was thinking, okay, this, there has to be a better way of doing this. So I had him on the phone, and um, he, was, he was kind of uh, yeah, asking me uh, what, um, how, how can we do this better? And he was using a, a local LoRa uh, communication, so he didn't use LoRaWAN, uh, what we build our network for. So we helped him and his developers a little bit to, um, uh, to connect it to our network. That makes everything already much easier. Uh, and now it's actually a product that you can buy. Um, and it's still open source, but you can also buy it as a product uh, for your vineyard. An another very good use case is to protect wildlife. Uh, tracking uh, rhinos and elephants is still the best way to protect them, knowing where they are so you can have anti-poaching units close to them protecting them. Uh, and this is also where LoRa is very useful because obviously you don't have cellular coverage and satellite is way too expensive. Uh, this is uh, also a very good one. Um, it's a very small sensor that's attached to the shield of a green sea turtle. And underwater, there's no coverage, but these turtles obviously have to uh, get, go up to get some air. And when uh, the sensor is above the water, uh, it can send a message about um, how the turtle is doing, if the turtle is still alive, and a little bit of the statistics about, uh, about the movements. Uh, and this is also to get insight in wildlife. And this is uh, uh, a very little obtrusive a use case for these um, turtles. It's actually in their interest. Another one is uh, cold chain monitoring. So it's just basically putting a sensor in the, in the cargo that needs to stay cool. Uh, and um, uh, that can be used, for example, for restaurants and hotels to see if the temperature in their coolers and freezers at night, do, because of a power outage, doesn't exceed a certain um, threshold. And another uh, really cool one that's actually here in Germany is uh, connecting station clocks to uh, our network. And that is to synchronize them, to, to synchronize them in time. But also, when you have these station clocks uh, connected, you can put other sensors in it to, for example, count the number of people based on uh, Wi-Fi signals and Bluetooth signals. And that gives insight in the crowd at a train station. And uh, this is our customer, Deutsche Bahn, uh, here in Germany, uh, who are building this clock, uh, connecting it to a private instance of our network uh, to, uh, to synchronize them and to let the clocks count people. This is the Berlin community. So this is, uh, our, this is taken from our website, where you see the, the gateways that are in the, in the city, in and around the city. Uh, at the moment, I took the screenshot, 61 gateways and 83 people here in Berlin that contribute uh, to the Things Network. And um, uh, one of the things that they do is, is a very simple uh, home uh, solar uh, weather station uh, that is put outside. You can see the, uh, the, the air uh, that can be uh, passed uh, through. And um, I asked uh, access to this application uh, just to give you an idea of um, what the data looks like. So uh, here, this is our uh, console. Uh, and here you see uh, in this application, um, I can go to the data, and there's streaming data of, um, of this particular box. And you see here the, the binary payload. So this is what the sensor actually sends as a, as a byte array. And uh, we have a very helpful uh, JavaScript functions that decode uh, bytes uh, into a JavaScript object, in this case, uh, decoded. So let me fix the alignment here a little bit. But this is a, um, oh, yeah. 
This is a uh, uh, basically decoding bytes because you cannot send XML or JSON over LoRa because the bandwidth is way too limited for that. So you send an array of bytes and then you process it this way. And then um, uh, what you see here in the data view is the decoded payload. So this bytes turn into this JSON object. And we also send you the metadata, so we give you um, something about the transmission speed, frequency that was used, but also the, fr the gateways that picked up that signal. And these are community gateways. They are operated by, by people you don't have to know here in Berlin. Uh, it could be institutes, uh, it could be uh, home enthusiasts, uh, and you can just make use of this network because it's already there. But of course, you can also set up a gateway yourself. So this particular, this is live data. This um, signal is picked up by uh, six, seven, eight, eight gateways, and that's a lot. And that means that if one gateway goes down, you still have seven other gateways that receive your message. So it's it's and it's free to use. So um, that's one of the use cases um, here in Berlin. But actually, if you go to larger scale deployments. Um, we need to go to big industrial deployments, uh, and that is also what this technology can enable. And one of our imaginary use cases is, is bananas. And here on the uh, left, you see my uh, grandfather. He had a wholesale company in bananas. Uh, unfortunately, I never got to, got to know him, but um, I, I heard from my father that bananas are a very difficult product because they get bruises uh, very soon, and uh, you basically only have a few days where you can sell them. And when you harvest them, they look like this. They are still green, and they are a bit small. And there is a, they go on a ship, and between harvestation and consumption, there's, uh, there's a few weeks, about three to four weeks. So it's a very delicate product. And this ripening process um, is delicate because they can get bruises easily throughout transportation, but also they need to ripe between harvestation and consumption, uh, for example, here in Europe. You can control the ripening process uh, between four days and eight days based on the temperature and the amount of ethylene gas. So you can kind of control that. So what you want to do uh, is to control the temperature and the ethylene gas throughout transportation. For example, uh, uh, when the bananas are in a ship in these containers. And for that, um, you need a uh, b banana ripening app, just as an example, that communicates with our network. And it could be a public network or a private network or both. And the goal would be to control temperature, humidity, and ethylene gas throughout the entire chain. And that means that you need coverage on the farm, on the ship, during transport, storage, and the shop, uh, when the banana, bananas uh, go from green to yellow. And these kind of use cases, these kind of change are not connected today. And existing technologies are also not very usable for that. LoRaWAN is and has the potential to be used in these kind of use cases. On a farm, you can install a gateway, like uh, the, the vineyard guy did, just install a gateway, or you can make use of a public network. Um, you can uh, provide coverage on a ship as well by setting up a gateway on a ship that has a satellite uh, backhaul. Um, during transport, you can set up a, a very small gateway. There are now about 60, 70 euros uh, in the truck to uh, monitor the sensors that are in the cargo on the truck. And the same goes for storage and in the shop. And um, uh, this allows you, for example, this technology can be used to uh, provide end-to-end -end, uh, coverage. And this is what LoRaWAN makes super powerful. So it can be used in different ways. You can have a public networks, public operated networks. So in the US, there's Comcast. In France, Buick Telecom, South Korea, SK. And there are a few dozen national operators that deploy a public LoRaWAN network. The Things Network is a collaborative network, um, so it's, set, it's managed and built by community people like here in Berlin. And then we very often get the question, so how do you make money? Because it's a non-profit foundation, it's a free network. Uh, and so we wanted a few years ago to work on this full-time. And so we decided to set up a commercial entity uh, where we 
uh, built the technology and we open source it, um, but we provide hosted version with SLA and support for commercial use. So for example, Deutsche Bahn, they are on a private network, they are a customer of ours, but they will also open up their network for the community because their gateways receive traffic from community sensors and uh, Deutsche Bahn would drop the traffic currently because they cannot handle it, they don't have the encryption keys. So instead of dropping it, they will contribute it back to the community network and the other way around to create one big network. So this is what we do. I, this is not a sales pitch, but this is just how we, um, uh, how we make this initiative sustainable. So we built a stack, and this is a network server stack, um, and we are about to release our third version. Uh, it's written in Go. Uh, it will be open source uh, next month. Um, the current version is already open source, but we are working on a new version from scratch, V3. Uh, we decided to go with Go because um, uh, when I started this, I was a freelance uh, C-sharp developer, and we wanted to create an open source ecosystem. And in 2015, and things have changed a little bit, but uh, it's, it, it wasn't a really good idea to start an open source project with uh, .NET, essentially. So um, I thought, okay, there has to be something new. I'm, I'm personally not a big fan of uh, Java, uh, and uh, so I was looking at other programming languages, and I found a website, uh, github.info, and it has really nice statistics about GitHub. And uh, I saw there a language that was coming up quite rapidly uh, called Go, and uh, it's really good for uh, concurrent uh, processes. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Go, um, but it's, it's worth looking at. Uh, and um, it's, it's very easy to learn, actually, for people that have both a C-style background or a Java-style background. So we built um, microservices to uh, connect the gateways, the gateway server, network server, uh, application server, and here on the right we have integrations. We don't build an IoT platform, but we instead integrate with IoT platforms like Azure IoT Hub, Google Cloud IoT, uh, AWS IoT, uh, but you can also have MQTT uh, support or webhooks uh, to work with your data. Um, we operate a global network, so um, we operate through the Things Network Foundation, four data centers ourselves, uh, and we have contributed uh, data centers also from the community uh, in Switzerland and in Australia. We also onboarded the UK. Uh, sometimes that's for regu regulatory reasons um, that the Swiss are, for example, not an EU member, so they want to uh, make sure that their data stays in the country, and it's the same for the UK. Uh, and we open this up also for others uh, to um, contribute their infrastructure and to become part of the core routing of the Things Network. A little bit about peering. So this is the, the Berlin train station. And uh, like I said, uh, Deutsche Bahn is uh, installing gateways on the Berlin train station uh, to uh, synchronize their clocks and to uh, get inside in the crowd at the train station. And uh, as you can see, and actually the circles are much bigger, uh, they also provide coverage uh, through the surroundings of the train station. And um, that's actually very helpful for the community. So, like I said, they open up their network. They, they will keep their, they don't open up their network, but they uh, control their own infrastructure. But the packets that are not for their own use cases will be uh, offloaded to the community network. And that works very much like the internet. So, we also looked at the success of the internet, of course, which is in fact just connecting a lot of. Uh, individual networks uh, together. So it's just uh, pairing of uh, traffic. We have another customer uh, who builds um, uh, solutions for um, restaurants and hotels. It's a, it's a box, like a physical box with a gateway and a few sensors. You can plug the gateway in the power outlet and you put the sensors in the fridges and in the freezers and um, you get inside in the temperature levels and you get alerts when they uh, rise above certain values. And for example, here's a hotel and there's a hotel and you see overlapping coverage. Uh, and that means that through our uh, peering infrastructure, they can also make use of each other's coverage. So that's a little bit about the Things Network. Um, we always say you are the network. 
Uh, and it means that you can actually, you are the network by setting up gateways to create coverage. Uh, you can contribute to our code base on GitHub. Um, you can uh, set up a community or you can join a community. Um, and uh, you can share la in labs stories, uh, how to's, or you can read how to do certain things. Uh, and I think that um, IoT was super new for me when I started this. I never worked with Arduino or Raspberry Pi before, but actually it's, it's quite easy, and especially if you have coverage, uh, you can get started quite quickly. So that's my, uh, that's my presentation about uh, TTN, and I'm happy to answer some questions.